Hello. Hi, Dr. Warner. Hi. Hi, Michael. Is this, uh, right, is this the right thing, Deborah? Yeah, honey, you're right, you're right here. I'm trying to. Are you, you going to share the screen with that PowerPoint? Sure, I can share it. Hold on a second. Let me open it up. Deborah, you're looking. Oh, who else hears us? Everybody. Everybody, honey. Oh, I got to check my language then. They know our relationship. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you both so much for being here tonight. Really appreciate it. So excited to have you. Good, thank you. I was gonna tell Deborah she looks hot. <laughs> <laughs> She's always gorgeous. <laughs> oh, thank you. <laughs> Michael and me have a, a long relationship. <laughs> <laughs> Hang on one second. Okay. You know, I have this strategy because I just realized my hair looks so ridiculous. But if I sit up really straight, then you can't see my top of my head. Right. Or if I adjust my camera. See, you don't have to fix yourself up, everybody. Just adjust your camera. So it only captures the part of you that you want seen. That's words to live by. <laughs> Dr. Michael, can you pronounce your last name for me, please? Can you see it on my, by my name, by my picture? I can, I can. You want me to, oh, pronounce it Levitan. Levitan, okay. Who's speaking now? I can't tell. Sheldon speaking. Hi, Hi Sheldon. How are you? Good. Hey, Dr. Warner. I gotta go mute for a second. I gotta call back in. Something's going on. My screen won't show. So I'm gonna call back in, okay? Okay, Sheldon is uh, showing right now, so that could be part of the reason, too. Do you need him to stop sharing the screen? Can, can he stop doing that for a second? Yeah, Sheldon, stop yeah. sharing. Okay. Okay. Woo! We're good. Okay, great. Now okay. He, can, he can do that. I, it just, I couldn't get my screen back. Okay. Okay, go ahead, Sheldon. Thank you to everybody who has joined. We're gonna get started like in five minutes. We just wanna give people time to log on. We are Facebook Live right now. So please go ahead and share. Go to the Minority Psychology Network page on Facebook. You can share. You can also go back later to view. In the meantime, check out our PowerPoint and let you know a little bit about who we are and what we do. You, you said you're on Facebook now? Yeah, we're Facebook Live right now. Okay, so just minority 
the Minority Psychology Network. Uh, all right, and I just share it. Yes, perfect. We're gonna give it like two more minutes, everybody, before we get started. We're gonna give it like two more minutes, everybody, before we get started. I can't hear you if you're talking. <laughs> I was just thinking it was not there. Oh. Again, everybody, thank you so much for joining. My name is Successful. I'm the founder and CEO of the Minority Psychology Network. We're super excited to have all of you here today. We have a really, really, really important topic that we're going to discuss and two special guests. I'm so excited to have them introduced. Um, we're going to get started in about a minute. We just want to give people time to log on. Again, we are Facebook Live, so feel free to go to the Minority Psychology Network on Facebook and share. In the meantime, please check out our PowerPoint, let you know a little bit about who we are and what we do and how you can contact us to see about future events. All right, speak to you guys soon. Perfect. Oh my God, it's better than usual because the condensed milk means. Maybe I should mute myself because everything I'm saying about the coffee. We can hear you, Michael. Minority Psychology Network, period. Please share it on Facebook Live, on my Facebook, and on the script Facebook, please. It's happening right now, so. Mm Okay, everybody, we're going to go ahead and get started. Again, my name is Successful. I'm the founder and CEO of the Minority Psychology Network. Super excited to have you all here today. A little bit about NPN. We are a nonprofit organization who works to break the stigma regarding mental health in minority communities. We do that through events such as these, through our podcasts. Um, we were just awarded a $100,000 grant from Booth Allen. So we, yes, thank you. So we're going to have a mobile mental health unit in LA that's going to go to minority communities and give resources, information, and psychoeducation to essential workers and minorities. We're also having an app developed right now. So there's a lot going on. We're super excited to be able to give psychoeducation and have these forums for everybody to just learn more about the topics of psychology. So Without further ado, um, a little disclaimer, tonight is not a therapy session. It is um, a form for you to be able to get knowledge and information and ask questions. If you would like further resources, please feel free to leave your email address in the chat. And we will also put our contact information there as well so that way you can get resources as needed and um, also learn about future events. 
So without further ado, I'm going to shoot it over to Sheldon, our Vice Chair of the Education Committee, and he will introduce our guest. So, hey, everybody. Uh, my name is Sheldon, as successful said. I am the Vice Chair of the Education Committee and super excited to have these two experts on male victims of domestic violence here to provide us with a presentation on a topic that isn't really discussed pretty much at all, really. Um, so without further ado, I'll let them introduce themselves. I'll start with Dr. Warner. Can you tell us a little bit about yourself? Sure, I'm Dr. Deborah Warner. I am a professor of Sheldon's at the Chicago School of Professional Psychology. Um, and he is an excellent student, also successful and a few other my other ones I see on here, Natalia. Um, and I am an expert in male survivor trauma and violence. Um, so some of you might follow me on the social media. Um, I also do a YouTube channel and I also have written a couple of books. And I'm here with my wonderful colleague that I've known for many years, Dr. Michael Levington, and I'm going to let him introduce himself. Okay, thank you. Uh, I'm Dr. Michael Levitan. I'm a therapist in private practice. I specialize in domestic violence and anger management and post-traumatic stress and child abuse and school violence and parenting. And I do a lot of lecturing and teaching and writing and I've been published many times. And um, my latest chapter coming out later this year in a, a handbook of uh, interpersonal violence is on suicide, which uh, that and post-traumatic stress is also a big problem nowadays with what's going on in our world. And I also, uh, I think Deborah does this as well, uh, Dr. Deborah. Um, will um, do expert witness testimony in courts. Have you done some of that, Dr. Deborah? Um, I just did that on Wednesday and I'm going back next week. So, okay, yeah. um, and it was on a domestic violence case that right. I was a part of. And so, yes, I do that. So I, right, so I do that as well. And I also do quite a bit of media work where I've been a spousal abuse expert, anger management expert of a, a lot of TV shows. My favorite was when I did the Tyra Banks show a couple of times as a spousal abuse expert. And that's enough about me. So um, what I thought we'd do is that me and Michael play off each other quite well. Um, so I'm going to put up a PowerPoint really quickly and we're going to follow along. Um, this is also, thank you, Sheldon, for inviting me and the Minority Psychology Network. Also a kickoff to the script conference that I do every year. And Michael also presents that with me. And I just presented this morning at the FBI on human trafficking as part of our kickoff. Oh, doing what's a lot of I gotta, well, let's play off each other. I've been working with a, um, a woman who was trafficked as a child from age 13 to age like 28. And we've been presenting and we're presenting again and maybe we'll present it. Yes, when is the script conference coming this year? Might as well tell the me and everyone else. The script is July 16th and 17th and it will be here on Zoom. And um, we will have a conglomerate of topics, but for to, to get people interested, we're doing a, a series of these until the conference actually starts. But if you're really interested in what we do, we recorded all of them last year. You can go to scriptconference.com, scriptconference.com and watch all the ones from last year. So let me pull up my screen real quick. And does everybody see that? I see it. Okay, so we're going to start the slideshow from the beginning. So this is script. This is the whole name of it. But today we're going to be talking about male violent um, victims of domestic violence. Um, and Michael loved the call. It's also a crime to beat a man. And <laughs> you line it, which I thought was quite clever. I found that on uh, on Google Images. I didn't come up with it. Oh, really? Yeah. Okay. So so I'm going to tell you about a case of someone, a case of Chris, just to get you thinking. Um, and basically, um, let me give you some background. So you might be a worker um, of domestic violence or working in a shelter or someone who just walks in your office. Okay. You're also in psychology or psychologist. And this person gets kicked out of their house by their partner. They have two black eyes. They're clutching their ribs. They have no money or income. Um, they're the caretaker of the home. They have two children, about five and seven years old. They're crying and they won't make eye contact with you. So I'm going to ask you a question. What, how do you help Chris and what questions do you ask? 
just shout it out because I can't see all of you in this view. I guess Hello. first I would ask Go ahead. is okay. Um, I guess first I would ask is first if like uh, if they need any water or food is like right there, um, mm -hmm. since they were kicked out, just you know common necessities. Okay. What else would you ask? Can I make a quick comment? Sure. That was excellent because the first thing you do, even if you're a therapist, psychologist, social worker, uh, the first thing you do is make sure they're safe and have water and food in the moment. You have to take care of people in the moment. Thank you. They could also be in shock. And that's one of the things that you wanna do if someone is in shock. But what, what else would you ask? Uh, um, someone who was a male was, I heard a male voice was going to comment. Um, hello, I'm Jadani Lewis. Um, one thing that I would do to help Chris, just looking at everything that he's coming in with, is like just have a moment of silence with him, just to let the like energy like flow. Okay. Good. Yeah. And I love that you said it was a he, um, but sometimes people always assume it's a woman. They don't believe men can be abused and be have domestic violence. And some of the things that you might want to ask you, or would it make a difference if of the person's race, if they came in, if they're a black person or a white person or an Asian person, would it make a difference to you and how you responded? Be honest, it should. Just because we're on different playing fields, right? There's nothing wrong with saying yes, it would. And it gender. Does, it does Go ahead. to me, all of that. Gay, straight, black, white, Chicano, anything. Old, young. I think age plays a big factor as well. So by looking at that age, it's like, it's like a different momentum shift that you have to like hit it with to ask questions and really see like what the necessity like of how you could like, what am I trying to say? Basically, I'm trying to say like age matters. Like if they're young, like you obviously wouldn't like offer them like beer or wine, you offer them like water and like try to figure out toys and stuff. Like with a teenager, you know, different type of games and stuff like that, adult. Um, dang, that's different. I wouldn't even know how to hit an adult with a different gender. That's honest. And, you know, it, it would change your perception of the whole situation, right? I mean, all the things that go through your head, like how, how in the world, right, is this person like experiencing this? And what if I told you that James is 185, 95 pounds and the person who abused him is 110 pounds wet? This happens. I've seen it happen. And the first thing you want to do is go do, do a lot more damage when they're physically abusive than women do. And you could look at the rates in the uh, emergency rooms to see what happens there. Um, let's see, I wanna go to um, the injuries. There, there it is. In one year, one in seven women and one in 25 men are injured. They mean a tendency towards severe injury rather than lesser ones. 20,000 phone calls a day to the hotlines, 15% of all violent crime. I think it's more than that. And then you see what happens with the weapon, the increase of homicide. Can we, uh, next slide, Deborah, please, Dr. Deborah. And just very briefly, you can see what happens, men and women with rape. There is a preponderance of uh, cases against women rape and stalking also, a lot more women are stalked than men. Uh, can we keep going? Sure, but you have two uh, hours, so. You can talk to, more. I don't want to expand on this stuff. Okay. More than that. So this one's mine. Yeah. So male stigma in um, society. One thing I want to get people to know is that one in four men, like Michael said, have experienced physical violence in an intimate partner relationship. Whether that is in a man, woman, man, man, um, transgender, like, you know, um, all of those things, they have experienced it. The thing is that they don't talk about it. And we know that because um, Richard Gardner even talks about um, men who are sexually abused have the false belief that men cannot be sexually abused. And that's not true. 
women can rape men and they can do that in a domestic violence situation and in partner violence. But if you have that, if people have that stigma about that, what do they have about um, other types of abuse, right? Because if there's other, there's other types of abuse that's not coming forward and there's, and Michael said all these statistics, what is that about? This could be due to how we socialize men and what we say to men and the messages. Instead of saying, don't hit girls, we should say, don't hit anyone. Because what we're doing is saying, well, girls, you know, they're fragile. We, we shouldn't hit them, but it's okay if you get hit. It's okay if you're abused, right? Because you should be able to handle it. You should be strong. See, because one of the things that we do in society is that we want men to be all of these things, the male, the, the athlete, the entrepreneur, the top executive, the, all of these things that we consider masculine, assertive, right? But if men are not, then guess what? They're seen as weak. You hear people call them sissies. You hear people say you're less than a man, right? I mean, I had someone actually tell me that because they disclosed that they were being abused in a marriage relationship and they didn't want anyone to see them as less than a man. So they put up with it. And they end up in prison. That that is stuff we have to stop because sometimes you cannot control this. You could be the biggest, strongest guy in the world, and it happens to you, and that is devastating to the male psyche. Deborah, Dr. Deborah, let me come in a little. Yeah. Sort of follow up what you're saying there. Uh, by the way, I never really heard it in those terms, simple terms, and it's simple but profound. I love what you said, Dr. Deborah. That. Boys are told when they're little, never hit a woman. But the way you expressed it, never hit anyone, because that's where a lot of violence takes place, male on male violence in the streets. We could talk about homicides in the black community, male on male, gang on gang, stuff like that. And the thing is about, just to follow up and said about the socialization, you know, as a, I was a, little boy growing up in New York. And uh, not only were you called these names, your sissy and the P word, you know, it's interesting that men are called uh, female type terms, but they don't live up to what you're supposed to live up to. But in my area where I grew up in Brooklyn, you weren't just called names if you didn't, you know, rise to that threshold of what a, a man should be. Some, sometimes you were beat up by other guys just because you didn't do the male thing. So it's very true. And that conditions you. You don't want to get called names because those names last for years and you don't want to get beat up. So you're forced to adopt this male persona that we're conditioned about in our society. All right. Yeah, and I want to take it a step further because we have this male persona and I'm talking about a westernized view. What about a view as a black man? You're going to go and tell your, your, your dad or your brother or whatever that you were beaten up by your wife. I don't think that happens. I see people grinning, right? Well, it's because in our, my culture, right? You would never do that. The, the response would be, can't you keep your woman in check? Can't you keep your female in check? Yeah. And you're like, no, I can't, <laughs> you know? And, and, and you, you try to explain the dynamic and you can. And a lot of times you stay for many reasons, right? The kids um, that you don't think you'll get anybody else that you, you're, let, let, me, let me put another wrench into it. Imagine like you're, you're a black man and you know, your mom is, is the disciplinarian in your family, right? So you're taught that you take that, right? Well, then when you get in your marriage, you have a wife, you're taught not to hit girls and she's acting the same way. You're used to it. But we can't do that as a culture anymore because it's causing these problems. It's causing violence, it's causing anger. If you're raised with violence and anger, you're going to be angry, right? Whether you're a man or a woman. So it's not okay that my mother, you know, who's 87 years old, you know, we believe we got whoopings, but that I realized that that's not okay. In, in generations, we still did that. We have to stop as a culture in doing that. So, some myths about domestic violence you don't hit women, you're not a real man. 
they won't believe me. You can't, you can't take it. What's wrong with you? Men don't need support. It's a man's world. In a people of color populations, is it cultural, right? And I just said, it's got, it's got to be cultural. And it's not really a man's world, right? We have a different viewpoint of the world than our westernized friends, OK? And in, you'll be like, oh, can you can't control your life. What's the Black dynamic? Is it generational? Well, it is. Now, I want to throw something else out there. It is because here's the deal with it being generational in domestic violence in the Black culture. We were slaves at one point, right? We were given violence to keep us in line. Well, if you had Black sons, you had Black daughters, you did that because if you did it, the master could cripple or kill your child. If you did it, you knew not to, right? And you did that to keep them submissive. Right? So then you have a wife who's acting out. What are you going to do? What you've been taught to do. This is a generational thing. We were brought here in a different way. We were controlled in a different way. And now that generational trauma has crept in to how we have relationships and dynamics. The difference is it's a disproportionate amount of people of color in prisons for this problem. We've got to solve it. We have need more education. We need more coping skills. We need resources that fix the problem instead of judging the problem. Michael, you have anything to add? Yeah, uh, well, I was just thinking when you're talking about the physical discipline, this, um, my dad uh, would spank me and my stepmother would say, you didn't hit him hard enough because he spilled a glass of milk this afternoon. This is a typical thing I'm saying. Mm -hmm. And my dad was in a way, he was kind of, uh, and it's really interesting, he was kind of afraid of my stepmother. Not physically so much, but her anger and her, her just nastiness. He was afraid, so he had to please her. So my dad got into this routine of spanking me harder and harder and she resented me because I wasn't a real child. To please, he spanked me harder and harder to please her. And at the time, just like you said, Dr. Deborah, I knew it was wrong. And I've never done it to my child. That's the difference, right? And I knew, somehow, I knew it as a kid, it was wrong. Yeah, and, and when my mom told me to get my own switch off the tree and, and whoop my behind, I knew that was not okay, right? And that hurt, right? And I knew I'd never do that to my own children, but my mother did not have any other tools. I realized there were other tools and I made it my life's work to teach people other tools to use, right? And, and in doing that, my mom realized, cause I used to babysit, that there were other ways to handle things. I taught her about timeout. I taught my own mother about the use of timeout and the use of taking away rewards and punishment and attention and all of that stuff because I got educated on it. And in doing that, my mother who had no other tools began to use those tools when she would work in the school district and things like that. Cause that's all she knew was, was yelling and, and giving, I, they weren't spankings, they were whoopings, they were beatings, that's what I, you know? And, 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 and that, that lack of education that is there in, in different people of color communities is why we have the domestic violence and things continue, right? All right. So where does all of this come from? It comes from microaggressions with our macrostemic messages. We're, we just had a macrostemic message that came into this room, didn't we? It couldn't have been a stronger one. I mean, couldn't have planned that, right? And, and, and in that, our one-on-one -on -one interactions, we were all shaken by that, right? And imagine taking that in. It's those little things, right? It's those little things every day, like someone following you around the store or somebody paying just too much attention to you in a store, right? Uh. And that stuff builds up. And imagine, though, you have, you have someone with a, a very gregarious husband or wife and you don't you're living in a neighborhood and you don't want people looking at you what do you do you act out right because of the macro simic stuff saying you need to be quiet you need to fit in a box you need to be a certain way right and that causes a problem 
And in doing that and looking at these one-on-ones, we have to open our minds to diversity. Diversity is key, okay? And he, here's an example of, of a case. There was this case of this kid, I forget what city it was, and he was throwing rocks at cops. He was, he was protesting and he was throwing rocks at cops, right? Someone called his mother and she came down there, his black mother. Now imagine if you've ever been chastised by a black mother, what her response was, okay? And let me tell you, she beat his behind in front of the cops, in front of the police, and she knew nobody was going to do anything about it. And they didn't. Their response was, well, that's that's how you handle it. That's that's the cycle. That I mean, that's what, you know, he shouldn't have been throwing rocks at the cops. Now, he shouldn't have been. But you don't go and beat your son in front of everybody. And then people sit there and laugh and cheer it on and say, yeah, that's what you do. Because guess what he's going to do when he gets in a relationship? He's going to repeat that dynamic. And he wasn't a small child. He was a big old linebacker kid. And here's his mom. Right? And what does that say to the black male psyche? What does that do to your self-esteem? What does that do to how you are creating patterns and, and scripts like in your head for how to behave with other people? It completely skews it in a certain direction, right? So what did the kid learn from that? He was protesting about something he believed in, right? But he's embarrassed. What does it do to the bond with his mother? It changes it, right? But guess what he does? He probably goes and finds that same type of woman when he gets married because that's what he's used to and comfortable with. Mm -hmm. And he wonders, why do I get all these women who beat me up? Dude, you're looking for your mom and you're trying to fix it. It's that simple, right? And then all future relationships are like this, okay? Or, or he, he, he goes a different direction. You know, he's looking for a dad that'll protect him. I mean, and all of these are from these dynamics of not realizing what's going on. Michael? No, let's go to the, to the next uh, slide. Okay, that's yours. So there's different dynamics that happen with when males are victimized in their relationships. Um, there's the case, these are all different scenarios that could play out. There's a mutual battering where one hits, then the other responds with violence. There's a physically violent relationship, meaning these people have not learned the tools that Deborah was referring to a moment ago. These people settle any disputes, disagreements, arguments with physical violence. It becomes a way of life. Another scenario is the man is getting hit and he responds with physical retaliation only when he is hit. Another one is the man responds by restraining. These are different men in different scenarios based on their own conditioning and education where they restrain the woman. Now, I'm the director, excuse me, of a uh, California certified domestic violence program which I've been directing for 25 years. And what a lot of men don't realize, I'm, I'm commenting on the restraining now, if you get hit by a woman in a relationship and you restrain, the next one says pushing away, you're guilty of domestic violence. Some men restrain by holding the woman down around hands around her neck, on the bed, on the floor, or just pushing away. Here's the thing that a lot of people don't realize about domestic violence. As kids, you learn in early school, or if you have a brother or sister in your home, you learn that they, they come in right away. Who started it? Who started it? As adults, and this is what I try to teach these guys in the group, we're adults now. It doesn't matter who started it. We're responsible for our own actions. If your spouse is hitting you, or, or slapping, whatever she's doing, you're responsible to respond in a nonviolent way. You can't justify it by restraining or pushing away or slapping back or hitting back. That's domestic violence. It does not matter who started it. Of course, both parties are guilty of domestic violence, but I'm saying a lot of the guys who wind up in my groups think that it's justified because they were hit first. Yeah, that's a lesson to learn. And then some, some men respond by covering up their, their faces or walking away. Please, let's go to the next, uh, Dr. Deborah. 
Okay. Oh, oh, could you go to the one after this and then I'll come back to a case of Edward? Okay. Now, another scenario here is the one-way violence toward the man, where the man is not reacting phys with physical violence. In this case, the man might be in fear of the woman. And I think that case, Deb, Dr. Deborah, you brought up with Chris in the beginning, and you said the difference in uh, height and weight and size, it doesn't matter. A man, even a large linebacker kind of, kind of a man can have fear of a woman who's physically abusive. We don't take into consideration the adrenaline flowing through a person when they're enraged. And some people get more enraged and more adrenalated than others. Next, there's a scenario where a man is getting hit and he has to continually practice anger management because he wants to strike back. And then there's some men, the third one here, who practice the ethos to never put hands on a woman. And that's how I was raised. A lot of us are raised a certain way, but in the heat of the moment, we don't live up to how we were raised. That's the part where we have to be mindful and conscious. Just because you were raised that way, never put hands on a woman, just because you firmly believe in it, this is getting into the nitty gritty of the work I do in groups. What happens in the heat of the moment with what you've been raised and what your full belief in never put hands on a woman? You have to be that conscious in the, in the moment to follow through on that belief, never put hands on a woman. Any thoughts on that, uh, Dr. Deborah? No, I mean, it's, it's completely true. It's interesting because I, you know, I'm raising my son. You don't hit girls, but I'm not raising, I'm raising him not to hit people. Right. And I'm saying, and girls are weaker than you. Girls are. But <laughs> you have a girl who slaps you upside the head with a frying pan. Right. You, you need to defend yourself. I'm sorry. Right. You don't allow that to happen. Or you get out of the house or yep. you leave. I'm giving him, I give him options for his behavior. Cause I said, here's what's going to happen to you. Cause I'm trying to protect my black son also is that they're going to believe you did it. No matter what. You're a man. And even if you weren't black, they would believe you're a boy and you hit a girl. I said, so you need these options. You need these tools, right? Yeah. To help you. I said, because in the heat of the moment, you don't know how you're going to react if someone hits you upside the head with a frying pan. I mean, I was raised, my, my grandmother used to take out, you, you've seen the, the uh, you, you guys may not know, you might say too young, but Clint Eastwood used to have this huge gun, a white pearl handled um, gun, like the, the long ones with the, I forgot the name of it now. But anyways, she had one of these guns and she used to shoot my grandfather. You're talking, you're talking about your grandmother? Yes, she used to shoot him. And she, she loved to shoot him in his ankles. And she, we get these calls from Texas saying that he, she shot him. And so we're like, you need to put grandma in jail. Grandma shouldn't be shooting you. Like, you can't do this, like all this stuff. And, and so my grandma used to clean all the, the judges homes and she would also pay off the cops, like <laughs> to let her out. So nothing ever happened to her. And, and, but even if it did, like she would go to jail and serve her time, like he wouldn't come and press charges. He would then change his story. He would then say, I can't do that to baby. And, and, and no one, and then he'd say, well, no one's going to believe that I didn't do anything to her, yeah. even though he's bleeding, he's bleeding. Right. It, and it wasn't a one-time occurrence. And so I, you know, I would always say, but grandpa, no one deserves to be treated that way. No one deserves that. Well, yeah, but she's a girl. I mean, that was ingrained in his head, you know, and, and all these years and they stayed together all those years. And every now and then she'd just shoot him. <laughs> so Dr. Deborah, can we go back a slide now? Yeah. So I want to talk about the case of Edward. This guy is a big guy. It says there, okay, I'll read it. Married with two children, two, two girls, I might add. Successful attorney. It's important. I'll bring, say why he had two daughters, why that's important. He's a dean of a law school. I'm not going to say which one. A, a prestigious law school in LA. Brilliant man, in a way. He's a sole provider for the family. Very large guy, maybe 6'3", 6'4". His wife, very petite. I think she came from South America. This case goes back about three years. 
and he suffered. He came to me. Uh, I'll tell you why he came: bruised, laceration, broken glasses, etc. Because they were getting divorced and there were custody issues. And um, nowadays, that um, here's a, a finding just in the last twenty years or so that research comes, and then articles, and then there's TV movies and magazine articles, and then finally the law comes around last to realize that domestic violence is a form of child abuse. This wasn't, people weren't hip to this years ago. Domestic violence is a form of child abuse. If you witness your parents fighting each other, you internalize not just mother and father, you internalize as a growing child with a brain that's developing you internalize their relationship. So now in custody issues, if domestic, this wasn't the case 20 years ago. In custody issues now, if one party is guilty of domestic violence, they're gonna have compromise or no custody. So this fellow, when there were custody issues coming up, this guy, Edward, um, there were bruises on him and it came to light in court that he was being physically abused by his very petite wife. And the point I want to make about this, and Deborah made this in the beginning, I think with that guy, Chris, or I think that's where you mentioned it. Chris. That she was very petite. I think she was 5'2", and this guy was about 6'3", six, 6'4". Six, it doesn't matter. It's another adds to the weight of what Deborah was saying about they don't believe you if you're a man. They don't believe you when they see you in court and you're so much bigger than your spouse that you're the one getting abused. And I work with this guy and this guy, uh, maybe for two years in therapy, after we finished his custody battle, he had a little post-traumatic stress from getting beaten so often by his wife. And um, he wanted to set also a good example for his daughters and not be an angry man in the house. And he not only believed it, but lived that credo of never put your hands on a woman. And he took it all those years. I think he was a really good guy. So we can move on. Do you have any questions so far? Yes, go ahead. Who is a question? I can't hear you. It's, it's um, is it muted? Jay. There you go. Okay. Um, successful has to unmute him. Successful, can you unmute him? He's raising his hand. I can't see his whole name, but it's J J A D. It says Y S C. Okay, okay. trying to. I Raise your hand and wave. Ask so me to unmute. I hope I hope he's with us. Ask her. He is. Ask her to unmute you. There you are. Okay. Um. um it's not really a question. It's more of like a like like a brain teaser. Like, okay, say that I'm like seven foot tall and the female is shorter than me, and like the issues are like clashing and stuff like that. Like, wouldn't you think that love would have carried out most of that, like, mental breakage? Say Wait, that what, one more time. What are you saying? Say it again, please. All right, all right. I'm, I'm trying to break it down in words. All right, so, because we're talking about males getting abused and, female, I mean, in the past it was females getting abused, but now it's, like, more occurring that males are getting abused. Like, wouldn't you think that, like, love, is like one of the main reasons why the male aspect doesn't want to like press charges or put a hands on a woman because of like that love type of like scenario. I have a comment about the, you mentioned love, right? Yeah. Here's what I think about love. <laughs> um, I think as we mature in life from 15 to 20 to 25 to 34, and we have more responsibilities, we have families and children, I think human beings need to update our definition of what love really is. It's a maturity to love that we don't have when we're 17, 18, 22, maybe. And love, if someone is abusing,
if someone is abusing you, you may have an attachment to them, you may feel lust for them, you may have a familiarity with them, but you have to ask yourself, are they loving you? Are you really loving them? I think we have to keep updating along with our maturity and growth in life, what the definition of love is. And, and what your love language is, people don't realize that. I mean, you learn your love language from your family and you're, if that is your love language, there is a flaw there <laughs> that you don't know what real love is. Real love does not hurt like that right? So there's, there's something that has changed in your attachment and your, your definition of love that, that needs to be worked on probably in therapy and, and love can, you know, change a lot of things and conquer all and, and all of that, but you need to learn to love respectfully. If not, then you're going to continue to be down, you know, this path. Loving respectfully is a big difference in just loving someone. And also, this is something I've heard many times. Uh, they say you're in a really good relationship, a good loving relationship, when the person you're with brings out the best in you and you bring out the best in them. That's yeah. support and caring and affection and real love. Yeah, that's the difference. Good question, good, good, good thought though. Debbie, you want to keep going? Sure. Any other questions so far? I have a question. So I was just wondering, as you all spoke, and you kind of touched on this a little bit, but I was wondering if you could go into it a little bit deeper of like, what are the signs that men should look out for if they're in an abusive relationship? Because theoretically, somebody can listen to some of the things that you're saying and still be like, my woman's not, you know, abusing me. This is not what's happening. Although you're describing exactly what this man is experiencing. Go ahead, Michael. Yeah, okay, I was gonna take that, okay. These are indicators, it's a good question because we didn't touch on that in our slides here, but it's a really good question. Um, it, it has to do with indicators of abuse. And there are many indicators. I like to say that you can probably get some indication of the person in the early dating. Let's say you go to a restaurant and the person you're with, and it's early, the first, second, third date, and you're in some restaurant. You could see how that person treats the, 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 the waiters, the waitresses, how they treat other people, uh, the guy who parked the car. They may be on their best behavior for you in the early stages, because that feeling of lust and they want you to like them, etc. See how they treat other people. That's an early. Now, once you're in a relationship, you have to see, oh, here's a saying I love to say. You know the old saying, you don't really know someone until you live with them? Well, I like to take it a little deeper. You don't know someone until you see how they manage and handle their anger. So if you're in early in the relationship and that person is exploding and slamming doors and cursing and screaming. Uh, it's a pretty good indicator. Indicator doesn't mean certainty, but it's an indicator, or as we say in the profession, a red flag that they could be physically violent at some point. Yeah. And I, you know, I always say, look how they watch other people. Someone asked me, how do you know if someone's a psychopath or a serial killer? I love to say when they go to a restaurant, how do they treat someone they're not trying to impress? How do they yeah. treat the car guy, the guy who parks their car, the waitress that brings them their food? Like, how do they treat people who have no, n nothing in their world? You know, they're, that doesn't feed their narcissism. That tells you a lot. And then how do they solve problems, right? How do they, how do they solve yeah. a problem when their dog piddles on the carpet? It's these little things, right? And I always say to someone, they say, oh, I met this guy. I'm so in love. No, you're infatuated. Wait four months, wait four months. And when you're comfortable using the restroom in front of that person, then tell me how you feel. Because that's when the, you, you can only hold it together so long, right? But that's when it gets real. And that's when you can really see how someone socially interacts in the world. There's always flags, but you have to be open to see them and not ignore them. Say, oh, it's just one time. No, there'll be another time. 
there'll be another time because as an adult your personality is set once you do something once you're going to do it again even though you'll try really hard not to it's still in there that's who you are. Part of being in a relationship is finding that person you can gel with and live with. Everybody's going to have flaws, but can you live with that? I want to highlight something you just said, Dr. Deborah. You said about, oh, it was only one time. I hear that with the men I work with in the groups so frequently. Oh, I only hit her once. I just pushed her once. And like Deborah was saying, no, we're creatures of habit. If we react to our angry feelings with some form of physicality, we're going to do it again and again and again until we learn different. Yeah. I guarantee you, you'll have it again. It might take a long time, but you're going to be in that situation again. Yeah. And that's why people, that's another reason. I mean, before, um, you know, love would, you mentioned love before. Uh, another reason people stay is they make excuses. Oh, it just happened once. They come because human beings so want to reach that place of being in love. And, and so we deny to ourselves all those abuses and indicators of abuse because we want to maintain that love place. Yeah, because we, we love the euphoricness of it. Yeah. But once that goes away, you're stuck with this person. I've been watching that show. What is it? Married at first for sight because it's such a train wreck. Mm. And there's, there's a guy on there right now, Michael, that I see him. And the minute I saw him, I said, Oh my God, he's a batter. Just by like, looking at him. Right. I, it was just the way he said some things that she must be submissive. She must obey me or there will, there, there will be consequences. Like, I mean, it's just the words he was choosing. You know, if I'm not first attracted to her, then it's just over. She needs to fix herself. Like, I mean, I'm just going, who talks that way about someone that you're supposedly going to spend the rest of your life with, right? He's talking about her as if he's training a dog. Now you're touching on something that I sometimes call male privilege. Talk about it. Because we have this, see, I think it goes to the larger society the patriarchal society. And even though women are now in business and administrators and in corporate world, uh, they still don't make the money that men earn. They still don't get the same opportunities. You need to be a really smart, ambitious woman like Dr. Deborah to make these opportunities, but that's another story. <laughs> no, but women are not getting, that's why there's a male privilege in our world that starts from the larger society. And we're not just conditioned by our family, we're conditioned by all the messages, the media, the social media, everything that says that men rule. And that has changed, but so many things change and slide back. Just looking at the last year and Black Lives Matter, look at the progress and then you slide back, you slide back. And, you know, we had a day just, what was it, last week, we had Martin Luther King Day. I guess we need a few Martin Luther King days every week. That's what I say. We need something. Yeah. Um, you know, and so I, you know, I was looking at discussion and Murray Strauss, Michael, you might've met Murray at one of the oh, IVATs. I did, I, yeah, I did uh, um, chair one of his, um, or a couple of his lectures at our conference, yeah. I just adored Murray. Like I have pictures of me with Murray. Like I videotaped Murray. I got video of him oh. talking about, his stuff, I, he's just, oh, he, I, when he I, died, I see, I, I see him as like the leading researcher on this stuff. Yeah, yeah. And so he, I got him, I asked him why he started doing this research, right? And and he said, you know, I ha he had a graduate student and he just couldn't figure out basically why she was staying. But he, he went around and he asked people, so all he asked is who hits? And they said, what do you mean? Well, in your family, like who hits who? And you would think everybody would say, oh, men abuse, right? 50, it was 50-50. My mom hits him or more hits him and or he hits my mom. Surprisingly, there wasn't just men. It's our myth that men are the most likely abusers, but it's not true. Women are just as abusive, right? So why don't we hear about women abusers? Well, we told you all of these things, stigma, right? No one believe them. We, you know, um, 
right? Um, having to socially go to work with a black eye and say your wife did it. Can you imagine? I have, I have kind of a question about this. I'm thinking of Murray Strauss because I remember I sat next to him at a dinner. I've talked to him a few times. One of the things that you're saying, Dr. Deborah, is that No. For all, some of the reasons you mentioned earlier, we're not culturally conditioned to even admit to ourselves, let alone anyone, that a woman abused us. So if men don't report, and, and I didn't ask Murray Strauss this question, how do we know then? How did he get around that in doing his data, all his surveys and, and studies he did, that there are women who abuse so much? If, if it's if it's so underreported by he asked men, the kids. Ask the children? He asked the children. No. Kids don't lie. Right. That's how we found out. Isn't that interesting? And um, and as they get older, they continue the cycle. They continue the the dysfunction because that's all they know, right? So we're creating this with our belief systems in this society. We're creating all of this, our belief systems and culture, our belief systems with gender, our belief systems and just how the media portrays things. I mean, we're a very voyeuristic society, right? So you, you don't really see happy news. <laughs> you see the, the, the bad news, right? Because you like to, people like to watch train wrecks. Imagine if we, instead of looking at the, the perpetrators and glorifying them and wanting to marry them and, and being fascinated by them. We focus on the survivors that have gone through that. Imagine if our news was focused on those things and those trials and all of those things those people go through, how it would change because the perpetrators weren't getting attention. I mean, we have the Unabomber, we have all of these people who commit these horrendous crimes. Why? Because they wanna be famous, they wanna be known because we are voyeuristic. That needs to change. If that changed, we'd probably see a redu reduction in domestic violence a lot, but we'd also see people reporting it more accurately because people would believe them because we focus on the survivors, not the perpetrators. You know, it's occurring to me that I have a question for you, Dr. Deborah, and I guess everyone, I have a question for myself. Because when you mention, okay, the Unabomber and these horrible men who do these horrible things, I'm thinking of the man who is not the serial killer or the Unabomber, the man who's like a, a macho, aggressive, violent kind of a male. Like John Gotti? Okay, so here's my question. <laughs> Why are so many women girls, women, so attracted to, because this is the other half of it we have to look at. Why are so many women attracted to the bad boy? Why is that? Because you're that, not supposed to Doesn't that to reinforce be. men to become bad boys? Yes, that's why our problem. Women, why are women attracted to that? Wait, wait, unmute, unmute. It has to be unmuted. Hello? Can you hear yes. me? Yes. Hi, I appreciate y'all today. My name is Maylani. I think that um, women are attracted to it because that's their idea of strength. Um, that's their ideology when it comes to strength. My, um, I appreciate you saying, you know, teaching your kid how like just not to hit, I have a five-year-old boy. So I'm definitely teaching him not to hit girls, but I didn't think not to just hit, you know, in general. But my ex-husband was abusive and his mom, I think a lot of it came from his mom was in the military and he wasn't raised with his mom. So he was um, really, really strict and stuff like that. And I think that had a lot to do with it um, too. But I think that we're drawn to things like that because they kind of give us this false sense of strength. And then at least if they know, you know, they're strong enough, just like with lions and stuff like that, you know, when they fight to see who are, whoever's the strongest in the, in the pack, you know, and then we go with them. I think that's why that happens pretty often. So Melani, was that your story with this abusive uh, man you chose? What was that? Was that your story? You were attracted to that abusive man because he appeared so strong at first? No, I think that for me personally, it was because I was dealing with um, 
a lot of like stress and depression and I was ready to get everything done fast I was ready to get married fast I was ready to be in love fast um I and when and when in trying to do that and trying to speed along that process that should take time to build um those types of relationships and boundaries I totally dismissed a whole bunch of flags not just with him but his mom has it like you know bipolar she pulled like a gun out just for having a conversation in a car on the side of the street. So experiences like that, I think that when it comes to black children and black males, I think that a lot of times they don't say anything because the respect, we put so much emphasis on respect for respect your mom and respect your parents and stuff like that. So when they do things like that, it's okay. So for my ex, when he voiced his anger and how he, he dealt with that stuff and how he treated me, um, and he gets a lot of that from his mom. It was okay. Cause you know, that's his mom and that's just, you know, and you're supposed to respect your mom and you don't question your mom. It makes sense. Cause we are taught that, you know, through all culture, you, you respect your parents, right? You respect your elders, right? Even if your elders are teaching you bad habits. Right. Did anyone else have a comment, someone else about why? I brought up why so many women, not all, are attracted to the bad boy. Because I do think what Melani, what you said, it does, especially till you know someone in a deeper way, seem to represent strength. And did you bring up, I think you also mentioned something about lions. And we can see that on Discovery, but we're human and we're animals. And we have a highly developed brain if we use it, but we also have a primitive part of us that sometimes comes out. And we see that as strength, even though it's violence and aggression. I think um, the gentleman who shared earlier wanted to say something. Yes. I can't hear you though. You gotta ask to be unmuted. Okay, now go. <laughs> Hello, my name is Adani. Um, Dean, that's a really good question. Well, my answer to why girls go for the kind of macho vanity dudes or bad yeah. boy, as you want to say, is because, like, the only thing that they see it on is TV, social media. So just seeing all those movies and TV shows of, like, how they got treated and then they come back to reality and you're like, okay, I need me one of those, you know? So it's just kind of like a brain favoritism type of thing. That's my opinion. The media does influence us for sure, especially nowadays, social media. Um, um, I guess say another reason why is because say you have a kid, like would you rather have a kid with somebody that's small and skinny that you know for a fact that you got to protect him and your kid or you just got a whole bigger bad dude that's not going to let nothing get in the way of that, you know? So just two other ways to look at it. True. That's good. Good stuff. True. And there is definitely some culture specific stuff, but I'm wondering, is there a guardedness due to distrust and history among Black America of why they don't share? I would say definitely. I mean, you're already told that, you know, white man's out to get you, the world is against you. You got to be strong. And to hear that, your woman of all people is the one that's abusing you. That's like a complete emasculation. If people were to under, if people were to hear about that, it's basically saying you can't do nothing right. Not only that you're not a man, you're probably less than. Mm. If that's the case in some, you know, communities. That's a good point. Yeah. Good point. And, and what you know, what what if it's a, a man to a man? in the black community. Can you imagine? You've already chosen, to, you, you're, you're gay, right? Whether by choice or whether by how you feel, right? Um, ho however you want to define it. And then you're getting abused by your partner or you're transgendered. Would that be even more difficult to come out and say? Probably so, we might even feed into uh like some of the negative stereotypes that are associated with some of those groups. Mm -hmm. So it's just stigma on top of stigma on top of stigma to where 
Like, why even say anything? You just might make it worse by saying something. Yeah, double and triple minority groups. That means you're black, you're gay, or you're transgendered, black, gay, or Hispanic and black, or whatever. You, know what I mean? you can be multiple, multiple things, right? It becomes even more difficult to ask for help because then you have the stigma yeah. of all different parts, right? And part of this is cultural, but part of this is part of the male conditioning we talked about. You don't share personal feelings. You know, it's the way you're conditioned and brought up. You could talk about women and how they look and their breasts or something. You could talk about sports. You can talk about cars. See, I'm making guys to have to be pretty dumb, aren't I, I guess. But, <laughs> but no, those are the conversations when you're growing up as a guy that you get into. You don't get into too many personal, deeper conversations where you are vulnerable. Very true. And that also speaks to one of the themes we're talking about today is why men do not report or admit that they're being abused. It's vulnerable. And you are conditioned not to be vulnerable. Anyone else have a comment about the black community and history and why we don't say anything? Um, yes, hello, Donnie, once again, I have a comment. Mm -hmm. um, I think it was that Willie Lynch paper. Just if, if you guys get a chance to just read that big info of like, like why, why society is the way it is now. And back to um, like they used to with the males, they used to strip them butt naked and like whip them in front of the, the mother and the child. So like mm -hmm. just having that type of like discography is like, yeah traumatizing in the black community so that's why is we look at it in like we the youth are looking at it now is like okay let's go with the gangs you know instead of like coming together you know because they feel like that's like a safe source you know what you're bringing up also touches on uh how important our peer groups are our friends our uh buddies we play football with or a gang that we join because if we didn't have a together family where we felt safe and secure, then kids are naturally going to go look for, if they're in Mexico, they may join a, early on at 14, join a drug cartel and be a runner. If you're in certain communities, you'll join a gang. I mean, kids are looking to belong. And when you, when you join those organizations, those gangs or cartels or whatever you're joining, then you're doomed to the culture, you know, that's like the lowest common denominator, violence, whose might makes right, the turf of the neighborhood, all that stuff. One of the things that, well, Deborah and I, we speak at a lot of conferences, we belong to organizations. And one of the things I've been working with, uh, with my friend, John McKenna, have you ever met him, uh, Deborah? I've talked about him, you've met him. He is the executive director now of two different organizations where they go into all kinds of communities throughout the world and get kids together and give them musical instruments, put them into choirs, get them to join because kids need to belong and a lot of kids don't have intact, secure families, get them to belong, belong to something that's creative and worthwhile with good, positive values. And that's what some of the things that we work on. Deborah, come back, Dr. Deborah, since you're. Uh... Okay. <laughs> Somehow I muted myself, but, um, <laughs> but yes, but you know, let me, let me throw another wrench in here of why this may not be reported um, in the black community. I mean, just men, you have to, you, you most likely in a social service setting, you're going to be reporting this to a woman and you're going to be telling a woman this, that you're being abused. Right. But let me throw this out there, putting in the color issue. You most likely may be reporting this to someone who is not of color. And there's a lot of distrust with that. 
in the black community, right? Especially in the inner city, because who usually comes in and takes your children away? They don't usually look like me, right? And then you have all of that going in there. You have all of this distrust and you want help, but you don't know where to get the resources because of the cultural ingrainedness of distrust within the community. Whether you're, you're purple, blue, green, yellow, or black, it's there culturally. And so that's something that you have to, to think about. One of the things I do when I'm working with clients of color is that I try to go on their turf. I don't really, you know, they, they may come to my office, but if I can meet them in a common place, especially the, the first meeting, especially if I'm working with their kids, like a Burger King or something like that, I do. Because it's easier for them to feel comfortable with me. I'm, I'm someone who, who they see in, in some kind of position of authority, right? And so I realized that. So I try to make it easier for them. Now, imagine if you had someone not of color doing that, it would, it would kind of take some of the guardedness away. People might look at them funny, but you're uncomfortable in their environment will say a lot for your credibility, right? Any other comments? Okay, does this guardedness, guardedness prevent change or get in the way of it? Well, I just gave you an example. Is there another way that being guarded and being scared can prevent change with, with, for domestic violence? Well, if we're not aware of the abuses going on, we can't do mm -hmm. anything about it. it absolutely. So guardedness does prevent change. And I think Melani has a question. Yes, she does. Okay, yes. My question was, I, I know we talked, Sheldon asked, I think I'm pretty sure that was Sheldon, about the symptoms of like the characteristics of what you can see whenever someone's an abuse, but that was about adults. So with someone raising a, a Black son, he is five, or just a son in general, my question is, what type of characteristics do you look at in children? Because you see all these boys that are abused in like, you know, the boys clubs, you know, the uh, church and stuff, a lot of their pastors and stuff, which is under, so what kind of, what kind of a characteristics do you look for in kids? Well, I'll give you one trait that uh, is always telling to me. And one, when you see it one time, you'll know what it is. It's called um, dead eyes. You look in someone's eyes and, and it's like they're not even there. You could be having a birthday party. You could be playing basketball. And it's like vacant. I know something's going on that's traumatic because of those eyes. Um, another thing is some, a boy, there's only one emotion men can have that's acceptable. You can't have the softer ones. It's anger. A boy that's constantly angry, constantly in fights, usually has been shown that, but they don't know how to deal with their emotions because they're not allowed. So they act out all over the place. They're striving for some sort of connection, but the only way they can do it is, is being angry. Men yeah, don't we, like to be criticized let me, either. Let me follow up on that, what you're just saying. If you look at uh, 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 the diagnostic manuals and you look at the diagnosis of depression, they differentiate between depression with an adult and depression mm -hmm. with a child. Yeah. With an adult, as we know, it's depressed mood, oversleeping, lethargy, no energy, down mood, all those things. With a child, Depression is manifested by acting out what you just said, Deborah. They'll act out, they'll get into trouble at school, they'll steal something from the store, they get in trouble. That's a sign of depression in children. And if you're growing up in a home where you're abused or your parents are violent, then pretty much most kids are going to feel some depression there. Yeah. And irritability, all of that, right? You're going to see a decline in their schoolwork. Right. Um, all of that goes with it. Did we answer your question, Milani? She's muted, but I think we hit a few things. Yeah. There's another yeah, that was, I appreciate it. That helped me out a lot. Thank you. Good. There's another uh, comment in the chat. Also, I feel we do not know how 
to identify the types of uh, uh, types of abuse. Um, many people think it's physical only. I, I do not think my mic is on for some reason. Yeah, it's not just physical. I mean, it's emotional, right? There's sexual too, but emotional abuse can really scar someone too because they're taking on all those emotions that they can't deal with. Um, they're learning, you're making synapses on how to interact in the world and the emotional stuff will carry, I mean, it carries a lot of weight in how you look at different relationships. And that was something in a very early slide that I mentioned, mm -hmm. that formally we used to think of it as only physical, like the word battering comes from the word bat, to hit, to bat someone. And nowadays we realize, no, uh, abuse in a relationship could be physical and, and, and emotional, like you say, mental, psychological, sexual, economic. Those are different types of abuse. Mm -hmm. And there's another comment in the chat. I would say Black families don't share because of the whole what happens in the house stays in the house. Very clear. You do not share because if you shared, then usually you got in trouble and it was a no-no to bring in someone outside the house. But that's also because usually people who do therapy, now it's changed. I mean, I've trained a lot of you who are on this call, didn't look like me. And so I was just in court. This is true story. I kid you not. I was in court going to testify and I had been working on this case for a year. I had talked to the family on the phone. I talked to the grandfather, the, you know, I thought I told them I was African-American. I told them to look me up, whatever. Right. I get in the court and I said, it's very nice to meet you, you know, and, and they're looking at me like, who are you? And I said, I'm Dr. Warner. They go, you're Dr. Warner. And I'm like, yeah, they go, you're black well, yeah, they go, we've never seen a black doctor. We've never seen a black psychologist. I mean, this is in 2021 here. And, 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 but because of where they lived, they were kind of rural. They had never, and they were just so overwhelmed. I, I think that they thought I was lying when I was on the phone. Like they just couldn't fathom it until I was standing right in front of them. And this was a DV case. And I remember talking about why this person was incarcerated in the dynamics. And they're sitting there going, yeah, yeah, that's right. That's what happened in our house. But they, they, they really said they had, they would never have believed that I was actually black. What's our next slide? Do we have, or just- our Ah, it's just questions. Next one is questions. Um, I have a, a comment to make if you don't mind. Sure. I wanted to add to why um, people may not be reporting, especially in the black community. Uh, there's definitely that like mistrust or like not willing to trust uh, because they don't look like you, um, especially for your kids, as you said, Dr. Deborah. But I was also wondering, I wonder if um, the mistrust that's already going on between the Black community and uh, police officers, I wonder if that has an effect to reporting domestic violence also. I can yes. give a general answer. Uh, mm -hmm. here's, you know what a thought I have about it? If you're in a community like the Black community and you've been I won't spell out the whole word, but if for generations you've been effed over by society, then it's almost intuitively wise not to trust. And we're not going to get into a discussion of this now, but there's a lot of distrust now about among the black community and others about even getting the vaccine for COVID. You kind of uh, have an a instinctive sense of, I'm not going to trust the society. I've been me and my people have been effed over for generations. Yeah. I mean, and, and, you know, there's, there's just trust the police because yeah, because if something's going on, you're not going to call the police about domestic violence because they might arrest somebody, right? Or they may not listen to the whole situation or, or if you're a man, you know, that you're automatically, especially if you're of color, they're going to think you're the problem. Absolutely. That's part of the dynamic. I mean, that's, because of the messages, because of our systemic racism in this society, that cannot not be a part of this conversation. That is definitely a big factor in it. When I call and I have to do a child abuse report or I have to do a report of violence, in the back of my head, I'm thinking, oh God, please let it be someone who understands my cultural issues here. 
right? And even me as a black woman reporting it, I think, how are they going to view me reporting this, right? That's part of my thought process too, is how am I going to present that in a way, right? So yeah, absolutely, 100%. That is in the air, that's in the dynamic, it's part of the problem. We got two more questions, something, two more comments in the chat. Yeah, not just arrest, but potentially kill you. Yes, possibly so. I mean, we've seen this. Um, well, that was a fear of mine in a past situation of my own. Well, Shannon, I'm so sorry you went through that. Um, but it is it is a reality. And, and I do get that. Other questions or comments? We have some time left, so it's, I'm fine with it being. I only have a couple oh. of minutes left, Dr. Deborah. Oh, you do? Okay, well then. Like two minutes oh, well. I got. You have two minutes? Well, let's, Michael, why don't you tell uh, tell people how to get a hold of you? Here, here are some resources some for resources, us. Some resources, right. And then, and I'm going to send this to Sheldon so he can pass this out to you. Here's my contact, but here's Dr. Michaels. And, um, and why don't you tell them more ways that they can get a hold of you, Michael? Well, these are the ways to uh, phone or email to contact me. And um, I do a lot of work with all communities, um, all types of abuse and violence and couples counseling. And um, I just wanna, so we talked about a lot of the problems, but I wanna just highlight this. Uh, one of the things, because I think it's, it's deeper than just when you first think about it, I'm gonna mention assertive behavior. One of the primary, I give out lots of papers in my groups that I have. And one of the primary distinctions and papers I give out has to do with the distinction between assertive behavior and aggressive behavior. Because too many people in our society, black and white and Mexican and Asian are passive. And we have, talking about myths of domestic violence, the myth of the violent person is that they're walking around angry, losing their temper all the time. That does happen. But what I notice even more often is people are passive. And when you're passive, you hold it in. And you can't see emotions. You can't weigh them or touch them, but they exist. And they, when you hold it in, it piles up and piles up and you have deeper resentment. So when it finally does come out, this is a typical uh, uh, profile of a batterer in addition to the angry guy losing his temper or woman, it's the person who holds it in, holds it in, then when they let it out, it comes out as an explosion and oftentimes violence. So one of the things I try to teach a lot is assertive behavior, where you're not being passive and just taking it all, and you're not being aggressive, where you're trying to intimidate or scare someone or, or put them down in a way or, 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 or hurt them. With assertive behavior, you learn, I call it the art of assertive behavior, how to stand up for yourself in a healthy, respectful way. And last thing I'll say about this, boy, do we have role models. I mentioned Martin Luther King before, what a role model. And we have many others in our society who can stand up for themselves and a larger group of people they represent and do it respectfully. I think we'd have a better world if we were more assertive, not passive, not aggressive, but assertive. And I wanna close with that. And I really appreciate the opportunity, Dr. Deborah, and to meet all of you people virtually. Can we call it virtually? What does virtually mean? Authentically, seem like a lot of authentic people. So thank you. Yes, thank you. And anyone, please reach out to me. I'm going to send this to Sheldon. I love coming. I, I love doing this. And um, this was just an amazing, amazing uh, talk. And if you have more questions, please send them to me too. Um, but um, 
just thank you for having us here. And please come to the script conference and you can learn more about this. If you want to present at the script conference, we love having students look for the call for papers and you can uh, present at the conference because everyone's there, like from law enforcement to Homeland Security, FBI, students, consumers, ex-gang members. It's it's for well, everybody and everybody's comment, in a first put name basis. On script conference. Huh? Put comment on script conference. Yeah. I've, I've spoken at everyone from the beginning and it's not self-promotion. It's not Deborah talking about script, it's me. It's a wonderful conference, not just for what we all learn, even though I teach there, I learn, but the spirit. And Dr. Deborah has so much to do with the spirit of love and camaraderie and togetherness and healing is just beautiful. So I highly recommend script. Oh, much love to you. How's that for a commercial? <laughs> so any... Anything else before we head off from you guys? Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you so much. Thank you guys. Definitely look forward to having you back. Oh, uh, not a problem. Thank you. Successful Thank Sheldon, you. all you guys. Love, love your name. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> I thought it was a description. And now I realize <laughs> it's your name. <laughs> yes. That's her name, Dave. <laughs> Bye. Bye. Love, everyone. Bye. Thank you, guys. Thank you all for attending tonight. If you'd like to contact us, here's our information right here. Also, please be sure to share on Facebook and social media. If you like to receive more resources and information, please make sure that you email us or DM us on either one of these sites. And everybody have a great night, and we look forward to the next time. Bye.